Hello, I'm Robert Paul Wolf, and this is the sixth in a series of lectures on ideological critique. Each week, as you know, I've been inviting one of my former students to join me in this imaginary classroom. Jennifer, Tom, Andrew, and Tanya have all been introduced to you, and they are now sitting in front of me before my lecture begins. Today, I would like to invite a yet another student to join us. This is a student from long ago, back in 1960, when he was my student at Harvard when I was a young instructor. In 1953, as a graduating senior, I took the great course on Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason with C.I. Lewis, the grand old man of the department. When he retired at the end of that semester, there was nobody to teach Kant at Harvard, and for seven years, nobody did. Then in 1960, I was invited to give the very same Kant course. Needless to say, I was thrilled and rather frightened by the thought. That year, a group of students took the course, including 12 graduate students and a number of undergraduates. Among the graduate students, one stood out, a young man who went on to become one of the most famous philosophers in the English-speaking world today, Thomas Nagel. Tom taught for a long time at Princeton and then joined the NYU philosophy department and law faculty. Tom, this may seem a bit of an imposition, but if you would be willing to join me in my imaginary classroom, I will ask you to take your seat along with my other students so that I can begin. Thank you. You will recall that last week I've introduced Wilmson's book, Land Filled with Flies, by analyzing in detail the introduction in which the major themes of the book are, are raised. I could sum up everything that I talked about last week in one phrase, which is that all human subjects are historically constructed. And that includes the Jew, these people living in the Kalahari, who were studied by Richard Lee and his team of ethnographers in the 1960s and 70s, because Lee believed that they were holdovers from a Paleolithic ancestry going back 100,000 years or more, still living the hunting, gathering, foraging life that our ancient ancestors had lived. Lee and his associates thought that by rushing out to the Kalahari and studying the Jew, they could learn something about how human beings lived 50 or 100,000 years ago, before the Neolithic Revolution of 10,000 years ago, that introduced agriculture, domestic animals, and cities, and completely changed human experience. By saying that all human be subjects are historically constructed, Wilmson was denying this fundamental premise of all of the research of Lee and his associates, and as we shall see beyond that, the research of other ethnographers studying other peoples in other parts of the world. But of course, that would still leave unanswered the fundamental question with which Lee started. How did Paleolithic human beings live 100,000, 50,000, 30,000 years ago? Did they have a class structure? Did they have politics? Wilmson does not know, and furthermore, he thinks we may never know. The evidence is simply not there, and we will not get it, Wilmson is convinced, by studying people living in the middle of the 20th century in the Kalahari Desert. Now let me turn to some of these themes and talk about them in much greater depth. I'm going to begin with the two central players in this drama, the Kalahari Desert itself and the supposed hunter-gatherers who lived there, variously called the Bushmen or the Kung, or as Wilmson calls them, the Jew. Let me start with the Kalahari Desert itself. The Kalahari Desert is 350,000 square miles in size. For those of you have, who have some sense of the map of southern Africa, it lies across the northern part of South Africa, the southern and central part of Botswana, and the eastern part of Namibia. How big is, 30, is 350,000 square miles? Well, the Kalahari Desert is 65% larger than all of the country of France. It's 30% larger than all of Texas. Or if you're an East Coast boy like myself, it's about 33 times the size of Massachusetts. It's a vast area. 
Wikipedia tells us, quote, the Kalahari Desert came into existence approximately 60 million years ago, along with the formation of the African, sub, uh, the African content. Now, Africa, as I'm sure you know, is divided really into two portions. The Mediterranean coast, including Egypt, and the sub-Saharan area, so, that is to say, south of the Sahara Desert, which you've all seen in endless movies, I'm sure. Africa itself has long been figured as outside of the scope of human civilization. Let me read you a famous passage by Hegel from his Philosophy of History. Those of you who know me well may be surprised that I'm reading Hegel at all, but in this case I'm reading him because what he says is so obviously false, and therefore I feel comfortable with reading it to you. Here is what Hegel says about Africa. Africa proper, as far as history goes back, has remained for all purposes of connection with the rest of the world, shut up. It is the gold land, compressed within itself, the land of childhood, which lying beyond the day of self-conscious history is enveloped in the dark mantle of night. I think it's that passage, more than anything else, that contributed to this notion that Africa is the dark continent. Now, I can tell you, having visited Africa 35 or 40 times in the last 25 years, I found it not dark at all. Indeed, it is mostly sunlit. And as it happens, since when I was going to Africa so often, there was a drought on, there were no clouds in the skies, and it is a bright sunlit world. But Africa is figured not only by Hegel, but also by almost everyone else who talks about it as remote, and especially the Kalahari is figured as remote. This notion of the Kalahari as a remote area is, of course, essential for the Lee theory about the Jew as prehistoric hunter-gatherers. You must keep that carefully in mind. If the Kalahari were not remote, if it were part of and interacting with the world around it, then there would be no way that those living there could still be living the life of human beings 100,000 years ago. It is because the Kalahari is so remote that it is at least theoretically possible that in this land that time forgot, there could be a group of people who simply never became part of history, were never affected by the Neolithic Revolution, the revolution that introduced agriculture and the domestication of animals and the building of cities. The Kalahari is actually, uh, by some accounts, officially remote because during the time when Lee and his associates were studying the Jew, and when Wilmson also was working in that part of Africa, there was a, a branch of the Botswana government, an office which was called the Remote Areas Development Office. That is to say, the Kalahari was governmentally, officially declared to be a remote area. Now, let me say just a word about that before I go on to Wilms's analysis. You will recall in my third lecture, I talked about the ideology of space consciousness, and among other things, about the imperialist ideology of space consciousness. The Botswana government being, of course, the heir to the imperial col colonial government introduced by the English. Well, the Kalahari may seem remote to those who are living in Habaroni, which is the capital of Botswana. It doesn't seem remote to the Jew. It's their home. They live there. They are born there. They grow up there. They get married there. They make their living there. They grow old there and they die there. It's not remote to them at all. What is remote to them is the government of Botswana or the government of South Africa, the cities of Pretoria and Cape Town and Johannesburg, or the cities of Morn and Khabarone in Botswana. But that's not the crucial question, because we're interested not in a definition, but in the historical relationship of this area to the rest of the world. And now Wilmson says something which, if you're not familiar with this background, will strike you as rather odd or puzzling, but is very important. I'm going to read you the passage, 
and then spend some time talking about it because it's central to what he is actually interested in. Here is what Wilmson has to say. I subscribe, says Wilmson, to important elements in the world system formulation. The world system formulation refers to the work of Immanuel Wallerstein, who developed something called world systems theory. Specifically, that most entities usually described as social systems, tribes, and so forth, are not complete social systems, and that there is, and has been for the centuries I, sh I shall be mainly concerned with, a unitary world system. Indeed, the data to be presented in the following chapters make it very difficult to think otherwise, as far as the Kalahari is concerned. Let me explain to you what this notion of world systems is all about. And in doing so, I want to make reference to two books, both of which I think are well worth your taking a look at. One of them is by a, a scholar named Janet Abu Lugold, and it is called Before European Hegemony. The other is by a scholar named Eric Wolf, and it is called Europe and the People Without History. For those of you who want to follow up on these suggestions, I will put a note on my blog with the information about these books, so you can find it there and pursue this if you're interested. Wallerstein's claim, backed up by the work of, of Abu Lugod and Wolf, is that the entire Eurasian landmass, stretching all the way on the west to France and beyond the English Channel to the, to the British Isles, and all the way on the east to China, constituted for centuries and centuries and centuries one single integrated economic system with trade traveling back and forth, connecting all the different parts of this Eurasian landmass, connecting Europe with North Africa, connecting the Middle East with the subcontinent of, of India, connecting India with the Malacca Straits, connecting through the Straits, uh, connecting to China. The whole area was one integrated trade system. And indeed, the evidence shows that this was true. It turns out, as Abu Lugod shows in great detail, that if you consult not only the, West, the, the sources in Western languages, but the sources also in Arabic and beyond that in Chinese and other languages, you will find that there was, all during what we call the Middle Ages, a network of trade. Goods would be traded from the fairs of France down to the Mediterranean coast to the cities of Genoa and Venice and across the Mediterranean to, to Egypt and to the e Middle East or the Near East and then carried by Arab traders in the Indian Ocean to the various cities along the coast of India and there to the Malacca Straits where the goods were traded to Chinese traders who had come down from China and then back again. Indeed, there are documents which show that the, that the Arab traders kept very, very careful track of the monsoon uh, winds that blew in one direction or another because they would blow one way for six months and the other way for six months. And if you caught, if you failed to catch those monsoon uh, winds going in your direction, you had to wait six months before you could again travel home. So they kept very careful track of such things. Now, that system is clearly established by the facts, but what about Africa? Was Africa included in this world system of the old world, of the Eurasian landmass? And the answer turns out to be yes. Arab traders traded south through the Sahara Desert, trans uh, transported goods over the Sahara Desert into West Africa, where they traded with the peoples whom they met there and with the kings of the nations that had been established there in the Middle Ages. Indeed, now, you might ask, what could the West Africans offer in return for the goods that were being brought by the Arab traders? Well, one answer was slaves, as you might imagine, but another answer was gold. Indeed, Eric Wolf estimates that there was a time in the Middle Ages when fully half of all the gold circulating in Northern Europe came from the, the mines of West Africa. 
uh, just to give you one example of the nature of the connection, the connectivity of these trade routes, Wolf talks about a moment in history in the Middle Ages when the gold mines of West Africa were actually connected with the sheep herding of Northern England. How so? Well, it turns out that in Northern England, there were sheep that produced a particularly fine kind of wool, which when woven into cloth made very fine woolen cloth. That woolen cloth was brought to London, taken across the English Channel to the French fairs, traded there by, and purchased there or got by trade by these Mediterranean traders who traded it to the Arab traders who took it across the Sahara and brought it to the kings of West Africa who paid for it with gold. And at one point the kings developed apparently a particular taste for this cloth which they used for their ceremonial robes. And that demand, that effective economic demand as we say these days for this woolen cloth actually triggered a small economic boom in northern England among the sheep herders there. So there was this connection of Africa with the, Euro, the, the world system of Eurasia. But that still says nothing about the Kalahari. If you look at a map, you will discover that the Kalahari Desert is give or take 3,500 miles from Nigeria. Africa is a very large continent. Well, what happens in Nigeria didn't automatically affect anything in the Kalahari 3,500 miles away. So what evidence, if any, is there that the Kalahari itself was involved in the world economic system? Well, it turns out the answer is there's a good deal of evidence, archaeological evidence, but evidence that requires not only that you pay attention to it, but also that you interpret it. Let me read you a passage from Wilson's book in which he talks about this, and then I'm going to talk at some length about the implications of these two pieces of evidence that he brings forward. Wilson writes the following. Let me just explain. He has just finished in his book, over many pages, going into great detail about archaeological digs in the Kalahari and what was found there in 30 or 40 different sites. This is work that took, obviously, an enormous amount of effort, very painstaking effort. And they, he says this, a large number of these sites that he's talking about in the eastern Hardveld Kalahari of Botswana were established by pastoralists during the 7th to the 11th century AD. Pastoralists are those who, uh, in this case, keep cattle. The earlier of these contained ceramics similar to others that are distributed widely in Zimbabwe and northern Transvaal by AD 600. Iron and copper tools and ornaments are abundant, and most, if not all, of them were manufactured locally. Wonderful houses of the kind still commonly made of cow dung and clay plaster applied to water frames in the region are preserved in some places. The agro pastoral economic form of these settlements is evident in the remains of cattle, sheep, and goats, which at some of the largest sites make up 80% of the faunal assemblage, the remaining 20% being of hunted wild animals. We're getting deep into the weeds here, but this is very important detail. Dung silicified by burning marks the presence of kraals, that is say, corrals as we now call them, on most of the 320 sites known from this period. At the larger sites, these reach diameters of 100 meters and depths of 150 centimeters, evidence that large herds were kept. Sorghum and cow bees appear to have been the principal crops. Finally, this is now the second piece of evidence, Cane glass beads manufactured in Indic or Arabic Asia and cowrie and conus shells, some of species that live only in estuaries of the Indian Ocean, were found at four of the largest sites. This is certain evidence that before a thousand years ago, agro-pastoral peoples in eastern Botswana participated in exchange networks that reached the east coast of the continent. <laughs>
let me now talk for a bit about this, starting with the second of these, the evidence of the beads and the cowrie shells. First of all, for those of you, again, who don't know Africa all that well, the Indian coast of Africa, the eastern coast where the Indian Ocean lies, is about 700 miles from the sites that were excavated in the Hardveld Kalahari in Botswana. 700 miles. What was found there were beads which come from India and cowrie shells that come only from certain river estuaries in India, which means that Arab traders were trading those beads in Africa when they stopped at, on the coast, bringing them to the coast of East Africa, and then traveling inland 700 miles to the to the Kalahari, where they were traded for something. What were they traded for? Well, first of all, we don't know. Could have been elephant tusks, could have been animal hides, could have been something else. We have no idea. But clearly they were traded. Well, you might say, all right, so these Paleolithic prehistoric people had a few beads. So what? What does that tell us? Now we have to use a little imagination. Let's remember something. The kinds of archaeological investigations that Wilmson is relying on commonly and universally reconstruct entire animals from bits of bone. A leg bone tells you that a hominid stood straight up rather than walking on his knuckles. A, a pelvic bone tells you that you're looking at a female rather than a male, or an old person rather than a young person. A jawbone tells you something about what they ate. A skull tells you something about the size of their brains and so forth and so on. It's very rare to find an entire skeleton, let alone a skeleton in, the, in a site where you have other things as well. So you have to make a series of inferences. And now what Wilmson invites us to do is to make the same sorts of inferences about the presence of cowrie shells and beads. Well, look, if, if the people living in the Kalahari, people like the Jew, were trading for, for trade goods, for beads and cowrie shells, this means that they were producing more than they were consuming because they had to have something extra to trade. They weren't simply ranging across the Kalahari like herds of animals, hunting and gathering and foraging, living off the land as it were. They were consciously and deliberately gathering or producing more than they needed to consume so that they could engage in trade. Now, if they are producing more than they consume, that tells you that they are engaged in economic activity, which raises such questions as, were there differences in the level of wealth of, in, the, in the Jew and the other people living in the Kalahari? Were some of them rich and some of them poor? Were some of them working for others as laborers? Were there some people who had enough to trade and others who didn't have enough to trade but had to consume whatever they could get their hands on? Was there, in short, an economy? Was there a politics? In other words, were they part of history? That's what's really at stake here. And all of this you can tell simply from the fact that they were engaged in trade with merchants who were coming long distances, presumably because what they had to trade was worth making the trip and worth trading their beads for. But we, what can we tell from any of this whether in fact there were differences in economic activity, in, in differences in economic level? Well, you can't tell from the beads, but you can tell from the excavation of these sites where, we've, where uh, were found the bones of animals. Let me explain how you can tell that. In these sites, <laughs> There's a variation in the nature of the bones. In some of the sites, large numbers of the bones are wild animals. Clearly, this is just bones of animals that were hunted down and eaten. But in some of the sites, there are a preponderance, up to 80%, of domestic animals, of cows and sheep and goats. The first thing that tells you is that they had property. 
they had domestic animals. The second thing that tell, it tells you is that there are differences in the relative wealth of, of the people living at these different sites. But there's more than that because Wilmson discovers when he examines the reports of these excavations that the age of the animals varies, the age at which they were killed. As I said, not only can you tell whether a human skeleton is of an old person or a young person from the bones, you can also tell that about a cow or a sheep or a goat. Now, people who keep cattle don't kill their young cattle or their young sheep or their young goats because those are going to reproduce and expand the herd. They wait until the animal is old before they kill it, even though the meat from the old animal is not as tasty and not as good as the meat from the young fat animal. But in some of these sites, the big ones, what was found was a preponderance of bones from young animals, which meant that this was a site where people were living who had the luxury of killing young animals for food. They didn't have to wait until the cow got old and couldn't reproduce anymore before they killed it off and ate it. What this tells us is that there were rich and there were poor living in the Kalahari a thousand years ago. Think about that. These are not Paleolithic hunter-gatherers who are indistinguishable from the animals ranging across the plain. These are people living in a society which there is, in which there is rich and there is poor. And almost certainly, if there were rich and there were poor, there were some people living there who worked for wages or worked for others. There were some people there who didn't work nearly as hard because they had large numbers of cattle and could afford to kill the young ones for meat. So what you had here, in short, was not what we would recognize living in an industrial society, but what certainly uh, an economist would recognize as a society with an economy with a class structure. And if it had a class structure, then almost certainly it had property. This is what Wilson means when he subtitles his book, A Political Economy of the Kalahari. All by itself, this is a devastating discovery by Wilson and demonstration because it completely undercuts the claim of Lee and his associates. The key is not that the Kalahari is or is not remote. That by itself means nothing. The key is that the Kalahari has for at least a thousand years and presumably for longer than that been an area where people were engaged in modern style, post-Neolithic revolution style, economic and political activity, and in which, therefore, it makes no sense to assume that the people you find living there are living the unchanged life of Paleolithic prehistoric human beings. All by itself, this is a devastating demonstration by Wilson. Now let me turn to the second player in this drama that Lee and his associates are, are giving us, the Bushman. First of all, let me say a word about the word Bushman. The word Bushman is actually originally a Dutch word, spelled almost the same and pronounced almost the same. It's a word that was invented by the Dutch settlers who eventually became the people we know as Afrikaners in South Africa and their corresponding uh, fellows in Botswana. Originally, it just meant somebody who lived in the bush. That is to say, not in one of the settlements that had been established either by those living there, the people living there whom the colonists found, or by the colonists themselves. Some people were living off in the bush, as it was called. And the term was sometimes applied to white men as well as to local residents. If a white man, as the saying goes, went native and went to live in the bush, and he came out of the bush, he would be called a bushman. But eventually, of course, the term came to prefer only to the native, the people native to that area. They were called Bushmen. Now, the term Bushman became a derogatory term. 
It's like the term Kafir in Afrikaans, which is the term used by the Afrikaners to refer to the Africans who worked on their farms. It's like the word nigger in, in, in America, and especially in uh, pre-Civil War America, but post-Civil War America as well. Here's what, here's what Wilson has to say about the word. He says, Primitive, savage, hunter-gatherer, forage, forager, bushman, basarwa, san. The names have changed. Their predicates and the premises from which these are drawn retain their negation of historically constructed objects. An analytical discourse that unquestioningly accepted these homo homogene homogenizing categories, appropriate only to the needs of its own moment, has left us nothing but a stereotype of its subject. What, what Wilmson is telling us here is that although the terms have changed, the way in which the anthropologists, along with everyone else, thought about these people didn't change. They just, well, they just recognized that they couldn't go on calling them Bushmen, so they called them hunter-gatherers or foragers. They called them San. But they, but they didn't change the way they thought about them. What are the supposed characteristics of these so-called Bushmen? Well, here's what Wilmson has to say about that. He says, in Dutch and English, these transformations in usage occurred during the period late 18th and early 19th centuries, when these groups were rapidly expanding geographically and consolidating their gains. These changes in nomenclature reference were ideological impositions by newly hegemonic, hegemonic powers upon subordinated peoples who were thus interpellated as subjects in a new order of social relations. That is quite a sentence. A good deal of the book is written that way. It's difficult, therefore. But what he's saying is these were not the way in which the people thought about each other. This, these are the ways in which colonial, uh, colonial folks thought about them and thought about them for the, their colonial purposes. No longer a serious threat to European power, San speakers acquired characteristics that the powerful commonly find in those they have subjugated. Meekness, innocence, passivity, indolence, coupled with physical strength and stamina, cheerfulness, absence of greed or indeed desires of any kind, internal egalitarianism, a penchant for living in the present, inability to take initiatives on their own behalf. This appears to be the first transition toward Bushmanness. These same characteristics are attributed ethnographically to Bushmen today. Let me read that series of characteristics again. Meekness, innocence, passivity, indolence, coupled with physical strength and stamina, cheerfulness, absence of greed or indeed desires of any kind, internal egalitarianism, a penchant for living in the president, inability to take initiatives on their own behalf. Does that sound familiar at all to any of you? That's exactly the way in which slaveholders talked about their slaves in pre-Civil War Southern United States. Cheerful, friendly, happy slaves, like children, living in the present, unable to take initiative on their own, possessed of great physical strength and capable of doing good work if they were directed by white men. That's just the way in which the slaves were talked about, and it's exactly the way in which the Bushmen are talked about. And it was no more true of the Bushmen than it was of the slaves. Indeed, let me tell you just for a minute, refer to a, a book that's one of my favorites in the in American history field, a book by Jacqueline Jones called American Work. Jacqueline Jones is one of the leading American historians of the Old South and of, and of slavery, and she's written a number of brilliant, brilliant books. She used to teach for a long time at Brandeis, and I got to know her when she lived there and I was teaching at UMass. actually invited her out to speak at UMass at one point. But she then moved 
to the University of Texas, Austin, and I haven't seen her since, although I've been in contact with her. In her book, American Work, Jones reports that the slave owners during pre-Civil War times took the view that their slaves were hardworking, industrious, physically strong, good workers, but needed direction. Children, but children who were not difficult, didn't make trouble, and who would work hard if they were, if they were kept to it. At the same period of time, Jones reports, the, the general view among the upper class southerner, southern whites of poor whites was that they were shiftless and lazy and indolent and were terrible workers. But then 20 years or 30 years after the Civil War, these stereotypes had completely flipped. Now it was the, the newly freed African Americans who were viewed as lazy, indolent, childlike, and terrible workers. And it was the formerly condemned uh, poor whites who were now viewed as hard workers and good employees. This had nothing to do at all with any facts about their actual behavior and was completely a, a, an ideological gloss that was put on things as a consequence of the end of slavery and the, and the loss of the Civil War. This is just the way... Now, the ethnographers would be appalled, you understand, to, th to be told that they were talking about the Bushmen, the San, in the same way that slave owners talked about slaves. But if you look at what they say about the Jew, it turns out that there are very striking parallels. All of this, all of this, is inferred by Wilmson from the evidence of beads and cowrie shells, from the evidence of animal bones in archaeological digs, and from an examination of the language that is used to describe the San. And from this he extracts the conclusion that the San, like everybody else in the world, are historically constructed human beings who live in a society and have lived in the society for thousands of years in which they engage in economic activities, have a politics, and in every other way are part of the modern world. They are not living in the land that time forgot. They are not living the life of Paleolithic hunter-gatherers unaltered in any fundamental way by the Neolithic Revolution. And therefore, what Wilmson is saying is, the entire enterprise engaged in by Lee and his associates is fundamentally misconceived. It's based on a false premise, and all of their results, therefore, are simply wrong. They do not tell us anything about how Paleolithic hunter-gatherers lived. Let me move on, but there's a great deal more to be said. Let me move on now to another subject, the subject of kinship. This is a subject which, of course, looms very, very large in anthropology and ethnography. Anthropologists love to trace out kinship relationships in the people they study. One of the reasons being that in the America or the Europe from which these anthropologists came in the 20th century, there were rather there were kinship relationships, but they were rather primitive kin kinship relationships. Let me give you an example from my own family, just to introduce this subject. My father was one of four children. He had two brothers and a sister. All of them married, eventually. So I had six uncles and aunts when I grew up. And those six uncles and aunts had among them six children. Mimi, Judy, Ruthie, Cora, Tony, and Adra. Those were my cousins on my father's side. On my mother's side, I knew very little about my... I knew who they were, but I couldn't remember their names, and I very rarely met them, because all of the family on my father's side lived in the same place, New York City, and therefore we would get together, most of them in Queens or in the Bronx. So we would get together for family gatherings, and I grew up with my cousins and with my uncles and aunts. It's a fascinating experience, by the way. It's very interesting to watch people grow old and to see the different ways in which people grow old and also the way they grow up. But that's about as far as my understanding of my kinship extended. 
I extended it a little bit further when I started going regularly to Paris, because in Paris I found two distant cousins. They were named, they are named, I still, still see them, Andre and Jacqueline Zarembovich. Where did Zarembovich come from? Well, it turns out that when my grandfather's father came to Castle Garden in 1879, his name was Abram Zarembovich, or Zarembovich, as I like to think of it. But when he got to Castle Garden, the immigration official said, not in this country, Zarembovich is not an American name. So he turned to my great-grandfather's brother, who had preceded him, and said, what's your name? And he said, Wolf, meaning Wolf Zarembovich. He apparently had gotten through with the name Zarembovich. So the immigration official said, fine, you are now Abram Wolf, and we became the Wolf family. But in France, the Zarembovichs retained the name. They had come from Poland, but they had settled in Paris. It turned out, I met my cousins, and it turned out that Andre's grandfather was my great-grandfather's brother. So my father's 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 brother was the father of the grandfather of the father of Andre Zarembovich. And so I am his father's father's brother's son's son's son. Now, anthropologists love this kind of stuff, and they have developed an elaborate no notation for keeping track of kinship structures. And if you read an anthropological work, such as Wilmson's book, you come across passages which seem utterly mysterious. Let me read you just one to show you what it sounds like. This is from relatively late in the book. Uh, Wilson has just got finished reproducing page after page of the kinship structure of the Jew. And he then says about somebody in particular, Kahai Tuvare, that's one of the peop one of the Jew whom he was got to know, is head of the junior Tuvare home house at Kaikai, which settled here along with the senior house after the removals from Southwest Africa. He is also the son of Tuwakuchi by a marriage to Pazikwane, the daughter of Katire and her second husband Kwane. You following all this? Kahai is married to Mar Mariam, whose MMMZDDD -D -D is Katya Terry, and whose classic classificatory cousin Katandu is the wife of Haruvesa Kahatera. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing all the names. It was the MMMZDDD -D 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 that stopped me. Well, MMMZDDD -D -D means mother's 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 sister's daughter's daughter daughter. Z for sister. Uh, because S stands for son. So the MMMZDDD, uh, what this means is, that if you translate it back, in, translate back into this terminology, what I was saying about my family, Andre is my FFFBSS, and I am his FFBSSS, okay? When you read anthropological literature, you come across this stuff all the time. But now Wilson makes a really fascinating point. He says, the way in which ethnographers deal with kinship is to treat it as a formal structure that is rigid in its application. And they then trace out how in certain tribes and certain among certain peoples, only certain kinship relations are appropriate for somebody to marry somebody else. So certain relationships are privileged for marriage purposes or privileged also for other kinds of purposes, which we'll talk about later on. But Wilson says something very, very interesting, something which when I read it struck me as quite unusual. He says, he says this, uh, Thierry, who's an anthropologist, wrestles with this problem and recognizes what I shall later refer to as strategy-selected memory in the construction of kinship relations. That's a fascinatingly mysterious phrase. Strategy-selected memory in the construction of kinship relations. What on earth does that mean? 
Let me explain, because this is part of Wilson's critique of the ethnographic work being done on the Jew. What it means, quite simply, is that the Jew, like many other people, treat their kinship relations not as a rigid fact that they must submit to, but as the opportunity for a variety of strategic choices and decisions to advance their interests. Let me explain what this means by reference to something very, very different, namely a work by the famous English historian Louis Namier, who lived until 1960. His most famous book is called The Structure of Politics at the Accession of George III. It's all about 18th century English politics, in other words. Now, what Namier discovered was that people living in the 18th century advanced their interests. This is, we're talking now about people of the landed gentry, lower levels or higher levels of the landed gentry. We're not talking about the working class people. These people advanced their interests by manipulating their kinship relationships to gain some advantage. For example, let's suppose there's a younger son in a family living in one of the counties of England on a modest estate. The oldest son is going to inherit the estate. What to do with the younger son? Well, the two most obvious possibilities to them was either to get a commission in the armed forces, in the army or the navy, or to get what was called a living, that is to say, to be appointed the pastor of a church on an estate. And the person who had the control of that was not the church, but the owner of the estate. The owner of the estate could decide who would get that living, who would be appointed a pastor. With that went a house, a little bit of land, and a salary so that you could live. Hence it was called a living. Well, how to get that? The, the, the way you got it was by establishing the, fact, the, the proposition that you were, bore a kin relation to the person who was wealthy enough to control either the uh, commission in the, in the army or the navy or the, or the living uh, on, a, on an estate. So what would happen is that the young man would travel up to London where he would go to the grand home of some wealthy person, a baronet or somebody of that sort. And he would present himself and say that he was a member of the Cheshire Fife Joneses. And he would claim to be a distant relation of this powerful man. The powerful man whose power in part consisted in his ability to hand out these plums to his distant relatives would then give this person a living or arrange for him to get a commission in the military. And that would in turn obligate this young man for life to this powerful man. This powerful man would extend his influence and power by having large numbers of people who were beholden to him for this kind of favor. Well. If you're lucky enough to have that kind of kinship relation, you could use it to get a decent position. But suppose that it's a little iffy. Suppose that as you trace out the kinship connections, there's a, there's a little gap in the linkage that you can't quite fill in. You can't figure out whether this person really is related to the next person up the line, which connects you to the wealthy uh, dispenser of favors. So you bend the truth a little bit, and you, you, you claim a kinship that that you don't quite, aren't quite able to prove as a way of advancing your interests. This is what's called a strategy selected use of kinship relations. And what Wilson discovered is that the Jew do exactly the same thing. They behave just like these English men in the 18th century. That is to say, when it serves their interests, they will emphasize a certain kinship relationship or even make a claim that nobody there present can quite refute because the only person who can refute it has died or lives some distance away. On the other hand, when they want to deny a kinship relationship because a demand is being made on them that they don't want to meet or because they seem to be committed to a marriage that they don't want to enter into, then they manage to fudge the kinship a little bit. 
they deny it or they pretend that it isn't as clear as it might be or they seem to remember something that nobody else can quite remember as a way of strategically manipulating the kinship system. Now notice what this means. I mean, this is kind of charming. What, what this is, by the way, I'll talk about this in my very last lecture. What this is, is exactly what Jane Austen wrote her novels about, right? This is the, this, the people that Lewis Namier is talking about are the people who show up in Jane Austen novels. And the kind of kinship connections that they emphasize, that they, that they strategically manipulate in order to advance their interests are just the kinds of kinship relationships that Namier is talking about. And they are just the kinds of kinship relations that the Jew are strategically manipulating as well. But what this tells us is they are not simply passive objects in an ethnographic structure. They are people who are consciously, self-consciously, and deliberately politically manipulating their social environment to advance their interests, to improve their economic situation, to gain a favorable marriage, or to gain access to a waterhole, which is I'll talk about more later, which is very, very important. This is the way in which these folks handled their relationships with one another and with the world. Now, what we have here is a series of evidences that all taken together build in the same way to undermine the Lee picture of the Jew and to support Wilson's claim made early on at the end of his the last two words of the introduction, that all subjects are historically constructed. That's the, that's the tagline that he uses to capture the idea that he's trying to communicate. And little by little, he builds up the evidence. Now, there's a great deal more to be said, but I want to stop here because there's a question we haven't yet addressed, and it's the question that will be the main subject of my last lecture on Wilmson. As I will continue next time with some more evidence of the ways in which it is clear that the Jew are not Paleolithic, prehistoric hunter-gatherers who have somehow survived for a hundred thousand years without change in the land that time forgot. But the question that we haven't yet answered is, if that's who the Jew aren't, who are the Jew? Who are they in the 20th and 21st centuries as people living in our world? And that's a subject to which Wilson devotes a great deal of time and attention because he discovered through looking at historical records, written records in the governments of South Africa, government offices of South Africa and Botswana, he discovered answers to these questions. And the answer, I think, will surprise you a good deal. We still haven't explained if these people are historically and socially constructed agents living in the larger world system of the, of the old world, why are they foraging in the Kalahari? And next week, I will answer that question and bring Wilson's critique of Lee and his associates to completion. Now, Jennifer, Tom, Andrew, Tanya, and Professor Thomas Nagel, I hope you found that interesting, and I hope you will all return next week when I will introduce another surprise guest to our little imaginary classroom. Thank you. <laughs>